can um, continue to just maintain the uh, gallery view or click on speaker view, whatever you prefer. I also have the added pleasure of my oldest son, Ben, uh, sitting in the room today with me out of camera view and joining us for our sit. So in past talks, I've shared this quote from Khalil Gibran, but it's worth repeating. And it serves as an opening for today's talk. Your neighbor is your other self dwelling behind a wall. In understanding, all walls shall fall down. Mudita, often translated as appreciative joy, like the other Brahma Viharas, serves as a cultivation of our heart capacities. We learn how to incline the heart mind with an attitude of metta, of kind friendliness. And we also learn and become practiced in doing this in the midst of another's pain or misfortune or sorrow, as well as in their happiness and joys and good fortune. In this practice, we come to see more and more deeply that the sense of separateness, of being apart from others, is an incorrect, albeit often deeply rooted view. And that similarities between ourselves and our neighbors far outnumber and outweigh differences. Last week, I took part in an event that involved bicycling many miles over the course of two days. Approximately 600 or so other people participated in this event. We wore similar cycling gear, slept overnight in the same location, and traveled along the same routes. It was obvious that some people were much more experienced, better trained, and in better shape and fit condition than others were. But none of the differences mattered when we were on the road together. Whenever a cyclist passed another cyclist who had pulled over at the side of the road, they were always asked over and over again, are you okay? Do you need anything? And many times I would see the situation later reverse itself. The cyclist who had first pulled over to take a drink, briefly rest and catch their breath, would now be the one asking the other cyclist, now pulled over for the same reasons, whether they were okay. Although the word metta wasn't mentioned in any way, shape, or form, there was definitely metta in the air. And in the face of any cyclist's apparent struggle, there was also immediate heartfelt karuna or compassion. Later that night, unfortunately, we received word that one of our fellow cyclists had collapsed on the road earlier that day and had experienced a significant medical crisis. The vast majority of us did not know this person at all and were not present when this crisis had occurred. But we all felt like a brother had fallen and prayers and heartfelt wishes for his recovery and his well-being and his family's well-being were heard throughout the evening. And so too, when the rides were completed at the end of each day, every person that cycled back in was greeted with cheers and celebration. Everyone, everyone was simply and truly happy for everyone else's success, irrespective of how they measured against each of their own experiences and achievements. This was mudita in the air and in between us. We live our lives all too often rooted in our own sense of separateness, isolated and distant from each other's pains and joys. 
We develop an inner numbness of sorts. We identify with our own needs and wants. And our innate sensitivities are often walled off as if we need personal protecting from our own open-heartedness. And although we may know better, we live as if we have a finite amount of love and tenderness to both give and receive. All the far and near enemies of mudita, including resentment, envy, jealousy, the comparing mind, and the graspings for sensory pleasure are things that we all know intimately well. So what exactly happened last week over those two days while I was sharing the road with hundreds of other cyclists? Where did the seemingly boundless goodwill from and within everyone come from? I think the answer is, <clears throat> that we were all on a journey together. We were feeling it and experiencing the journey. It was very visceral. But we don't tend to live our ordinary, everyday lives this way. Although we are always on this journey through life together. We all too easily forget about the joys and meaningfulness of interconnectedness this fundamental basic human necessity of interconnectedness. The Brahma Viharas are an intentional practice because without such deliberate practice, we'd have metta and karuna and mudita occasionally, just by mistake. We'd fall into this from time to time. much like the necessity for the consistent and committed practice of mindfulness itself. These practices root and ground us and our lives, much the same way that Lee was sharing the other day, how ethical practices, the practices of sila, anchor and orient our lives. We need these intentional practices that serve to anchor and orient our lives. And we also need intentional interconnectedness. I, conti I continue to be surprised by the extent to which the structures and the holding environments that are my various sanghas, including this one, help ground, anchor, and orient my life. I have a gratitude group, which helps me as well. I have spiritual and religious community and friends and companions and study partnerships that also provide important anchoring and orienting. I have professional groups with colleagues who are also dear friends. And my cycling buddies and groups also provide this for me. I somehow assume that at some point I just get it and not need all these external structures, these various communities and groups I am a part of and participate in to support all my heartful intentions. But this is not so. I will always need other people in my life, supporting and reinforcing every one of my noble and wholesome aspirations. I need people who wish well for me, are happy and delight in my good fortune, positive efforts and achievements. And others need me in this way as well. As a Sangha, I need all of you. And you need me. We need each other. And are here for each other even if only for several minutes each day online like this. In the practice of mudita, we draw from these wellsprings of support and care. We deliberately begin the practice by directing the intention of mudita 
toward dear friends or companions, someone within whom we can rejoice wholeheartedly in their joys and good qualities. I am sure <clears throat> that out of all the cyclists I rode with last week, there are some who possess some unwholesome qualities, if I got to know them more personally. But this point didn't matter much to me then. I was able to focus on their good qualities, on their wholesomeness, and see them through eyes of care and supportiveness. We are all fellow travelers together in this life's journey. This is part of the practice of mudita, and this focuses and calms and settles my mind, while it also gladdens and uplifts and strengthens and expands my heart. So after shaking out the body and allowing the mind to calm, still, and settle a bit, we deliberately bring an experience like the one I had last week to mind. We recall a time or an experience when the joys of interconnectedness was easy and readily available. It could be an experience on a retreat or in a spiritual or religious experience or a group exercise activity in some way like I shared, could be anything. With the conscious appreciation that in the same way that our body needs to be constantly and regularly stretched so that it retains some suppleness and flexibility, our heart-mind needs its own stretching as well. And bringing to mind powerful experiences of, interconnectedness, of interconnectedness helps us to remember that despite whatever differences, we are grounded among many dear and caring and well-intended fellow human beings. We can now begin to delight in their ease and be glad for their wellness and joy and good fortune and to wish for them peace and blessings for a good life in all ways. And in this way, we are practicing knowing that my neighbor is really my other self dwelling behind a wall, and that mudita shrinks and ultimately removes this wall. Yes, thank you. So let's take a little bit of time now to stretch the body. I'm shaking it out, seeing what it needs for right now, this moment. with no sense of rush, <clears throat> but with a sense of intention and deliberateness, we choose the posture for settling in. Maybe beginning by opening the eyes if they've been closed and taking in the presence of everybody here right now with us. Intentionally evoking a sense of interconnectedness. And then keeping the eyes open or closing them, whatever feels most comfortable and supportive.
offering for ourselves as much space and time as needed for settling. Choosing something to rest the attention, whether it's the felt sense of the breath in the body or sounds that the ears receive or the contact with the ground or the seat. What's it like right here and right now in the body? Just noticing. Noticing through eyes of care and supportiveness. And from time to time, I find it helpful to remind myself that wherever I find myself right here, right now, in whatever way I find myself,
is exactly where I need to be. Nothing else, nowhere else. Just this. Just this and just like this. Checking in from time to time with the mind. Noticing the thinking. And what's the overall energy like in the body as well? We notice in order to know, but we're not asking ourselves why we're experiencing what we are, just simply what? What is being experienced? Just notice.
I'm taking a moment now to bring to mind a good friend, somebody that feels near and dear. Thinking about some aspect of the light or goodness or joy or good fortune or success that they experience or have experienced. inclining the heart-mind towards a sense of appreciation for this friend's good fortune. This can be just in an image or evoking a felt sense in the body or it could be in using words in the mind. Words like, you know, I'm delighting in your good fortune. I'm so happy for you. I appreciate this for you. not imposing this on ourselves in some sort of a forceful sense, but just inviting it to come forth from the heart. remaining conscious and appreciative of the fact this is not the kind of giving that leaves us with any sort of deficiency or lack. Maybe just the opposite. And noticing what it's like in the body and in the mind and the heart. As we evoke this image or thought or words,
in this practice of mudita, there's this balance between actively engaging and offering the thoughts or the imagery of well wishes, of delighting in someone's joy and good fortune, and then sitting back and abiding in that space. Just breathing with the space. So we offer an intentional phrase or imagery of mudita, of appreciative joy, and then we pause and we take it in and we just be with that. Allow ourselves to experience that. What's it like for us when the energy in the body and the intentions and the thoughts all cohere together towards gladness for another person's good fortune? What's it like to be joyful for another person's joy? We're not stepping into their shoes and imagining what it's like for them. We're staying firmly grounded in our own body, in our own hearts, opening and abiding. And if we feel like this practice has touched us in this moment in some way, breathing in and with the felt sense experience. Inviting the awareness and the attention back to whatever chosen object for today, and whether it's the breath or sound, the contact with the ground.
and sensing for ourselves, what's it like right here, right now? Thank you, thank you for your practice and for being here. Let me just allow us 